Hi, you're 11 Standard. Um, just a few short bits of information regarding the study of COSI. You're doing a close study of text, so your job is to interpret this play COSI um, as a complete text within its own environment and its context, how it shapes meaning on the stage, its language, and how it pursues uh, drama as, a, as, a, as an art form and text. And really, um, as opposed to, say, anything where we find related texts and critical studies, you stay within that framework. So I thought I'd just do a few uh, basic sort of overview uh, uh, terms that we need to think about when we consider drama. On the screen there, you can see I've got um, a, f a few documents here which are related to the elements of drama. Now, we study those in, in drama itself, in, in, in the subject. But... Let's move them across to English just so we can get some meaning. And I'm starting with space, as you can see. And the reason why I'm starting with space, I've got an image of a proscenium theatre there. The reason why we're starting with space is space refers to both the stage um, and spatial design. And I thought I'd make it uh, an interesting statement that the theatre itself that COSI takes place in, and that is the space that they're asked to do the opera in, is very, very clearly defined by Naura, and that is that there's a hole in the roof and it's derelict and so forth. So there's a couple of arguments there about uh, does this place represent um, the mentally ill? Does this place represent a, a type of broken theatre? It's an imperfect theatre. It's theatre aware that is theatrical, and we'll get to that later about, about meta-theatre and what that actually means, because we're looking at a play within a play here, which is, which is a technique in of itself. So space and spatial design don't um, move away from the descriptions of the stage. It's very, very interesting in that way. Um, the other uh, sort of one we need to look at at the moment for you guys uh, is this time, place, and situation? Now that's also very, very interesting, and you must talk about this play in terms of its context when you're doing a close study of text. The image I've got there is for my students. That's from uh, Therese Requin, uh, which is by Emile Zola. Um, uh, the reason why I do that is very obvious that they're restricted into uh, by costume because of the time and the era. So movement uh, for the actor requires a special and specified type of performance, but in COSI, we're in a mental institution. Now, this is a frame from a very famous film called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. You may have heard of it. You may not have. Got Denny DeVito there. Um, there's, there's a Jack Nicholson film. You don't see Jack in that particular image or frame. And this is a moment that um, the patients in the hospital have had a uh, bit of a wild night. Um, They've paid off one of the guards and uh, let some girls in the place and they've run wild and they're busted the next morning by the nurse and this is when things get quite serious and damaging, particularly for Jack Nicholson's character who's organised this. But you can see there the um, the lack of, of definition of these characters, all wearing white with white walls in the background. The only element of colour is this tiny little banner they've put up here which is quickly and hastily torn down and this jacket here, which is removed. Uh, mental illness was seen as something to be hidden away, a sickness, um, something, uh, part, the bad part of society. And this film was made in 75, and the book is set in the 60s, so it's very much uh, contemporary of the era that um, Nara was looking at when it came to mental illness. Mental illness was certainly not seen as... Um, part of the human story that is that is all of us it is it was seen as a sickness uh, a delusion and a derangement these people were dangerous in a criminal sense because they were mentally ill and that's the way that we're looking at these people and the idea of justin asking um, lewis to, to direct this play uh, at the time is is almost like let's let's pay heed to um a kind of way of help making these guys healthy without really caring so much let's go back to um, here, and we've also got time, place, situation. We go here, this is 1971 in Australia, this is Melbourne. So by 1971, which is when it's set, I'm sure you're aware and you've studied the idea that um, there was a revolution in thinking about war 
uh, and that is being played out also in, in the hospital. Uh, so it's timely as well. If you think about the anti-Vietnam War protests, people think of the 60s. You're better off thinking of the 70s, uh, 1970 to about 1973 in Australia until about 1975 in America, because it wasn't until uh, really the wave of protests started um, after 1969, 1970, that things got going with the anti-Vietnam War. And it became due to the television and so forth. And you can study all that with your history teachers. It's interesting um, with space, we, saw, we also consider a couple of different important ideals in theatre. You've got symbolism. Symbols can help you understand and focus the drama. And they can sum up meaning of the performance, sometimes on a subconscious level. So you need to start looking for which symbols in this play um, are informing you on a subconscious level. The theatre itself, uh, the hospital itself, what the characters represent, what the play represents. Uh, all of those different elements that come together to shape meaning. It's a really good idea to do a, a set design project or to do a costume design project when you're studying uh, plays. It's very, very important to think about that. The other one, of course, as we know, is tension. Tension, as we know, it says here, drives all the force, in, uh, is the force that drives all drama. And it's a powerful and complex form of energy on the stage. Tension is derived through tasks, relationships, surprise, and mystery. And make a decision. Obviously, Lewis has a task. Uh, the relationships within that task become quite fractured. Roy and Lewis is one of the key relationships. But, of course, Roy, with some of those um, uh, other characters in that space, uh, are quite damaging and quite dangerous. A few surprises, particularly what happens when the play is performed, and some mystery, not so much, but... Um, these things play out for the theatre here. The other elements are movement. We don't need to worry about too much because we are not um, studying drama itself, but language is important. Ideas, feelings and needs expressed through verbal and non-verbal language. Dramatic action is enriched when vocal and physical dynamics are carefully used to reinforce and strengthen the language. And what that means is the language is, is alive on the stage. The language actually gives meaning and shape to what's being said. So lines from Roy, like, um, you must accept criticism uh, because you get a lot of it, <laughs> is, is, a, is a fantastic one because it really uh, hits home at how Roy sees sees Lewis and how his relationship with Lewis is, is, is on two levels, which is, which is pretty scary. Now, the other thing I wanted to actually talk to you about in the sense um, and let's type his name in here uh, in Google, is this guy, Brett. So when I type in Brett, see here, he comes up, Bertolt Brett. Now, he is a Wikipedia on him, and, and here you get this term, look at this, epic theatre. Let's open that. Now, there's a lot of writing there, isn't there? But epic theatre, uh, which is Brett's invention from the 1920s uh, in Varmia, Germany, uh, which is the Germany in between the two wars, He's not talking about epic theatre as in epic theatre on a grand scale. In fact, he's talking about the opposite. He's calling it epic theatre because he's, what he's trying to do is trying to get theatre back to a dynamic relationship with the audience where meaning is shaped through, uh, through theatre and therefore theatre becomes allegorical. It teaches us a lesson. And that's what the epic ballads of the Greeks and the Romans did in their day. And he was suggesting that theatre wasn't doing that. Theatre was only trying to get itself uh, mired in presenting reality as opposed to presenting um, a, a theatrical experience. So he wanted theatre to go back to this ideal. And in that way, one of his most famous things was that, you know, theatre should break fourth walls. Theatre should step through and engage directly with the audience. There is no need to present the idea that you are you know, presenting a, a complete reality, a deus ex mark, uh, sorry, a, a mise-en-scene reality. Everything in the scene is real. This is not what Brecht want. Wanted so symbols become bigger. Um, suitcases become symbols for journeys. Uh, uh, people wear um, a, a, a colour that represents a certain grouping or a certain idea or a certain emotion. And indeed, people are able to manipulate the theatre, theatrical space itself. And so, having a theatre which has a hole in the roof, there's mental illness straight away, uh, is in, in very, very much a sense epic theatre uh, in this way. And I would suggest that 
the greatest element of that at the end is when Lewis actually turns the lights off. Now, when it says he turns the lights off, mm -hmm. I would suggest, of course, it's very, very plainly clear that mm -hmm. the entire stage, therefore, a uh, lighting rig is switched off by Lewis. Uh, now, physically, he can't do that in a theatrical space because we know that there's no light switch that turns off all those theatre lights. It's run by a, by a three-phase power um, thing. But you time it. So the lighting guy suggests that all the lights in the theatre were participant of the actual uh, mimetic lighting in, on, on, in the space. And by mimetic, I mean lighting within staging as opposed to lighting that is um, that is uh, sort of fractured for symbolism. And when he turns those lights off, he's reminding us, just like in the play Cosi Fantucci, that we are just given an element of life here, a moment where we're illuminated briefly. And now I'm turning this story off and you have to go back and live your lives, but with this new information. So that's how this works in terms of it being Brechtian. So when you're studying this play, and when you're thinking about this play, I want you to think pretty much in those terms about what it is that's shaping meaning on stage through dramatic technique and language technique. Okay, thank you very much.